Griffith University is a Gold Coast institution and continues to grow. Its dynamic urban campus blending seamlessly into the region's world-class attractions. And now, partnering with the Gold Coast's cultural leader, Hotter Home of the Arts, we're proud to present our signature thought leadership and conversation series, helmed by master interviewer Kerry O'Brien. Welcome to A Better Future for All. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Could I ask you to take your seats, please? My name is Carolyn Evans. I'm the Vice Chancellor at Griffith University, and Griffith University is proud to be partnering with Hotter, the home of the arts, here on the beautiful Gold Coast for this series of conversations, creating a better future for all. Could I begin by respectfully acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, the Kumbamere and the Yugambeh people, the traditional custodians for many generations, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Could I also acknowledge the councillors of the City of Gold Coast, Acting Superintendent Ben Martin of the Queensland Police Service, and the Chair of the Hotter Board of Directors, Professor Emeritus Ned Pankhurst. Well, welcome everyone to the latest in the series of Creating a Better Future for All, hosted as always by the inimitable Kerry O'Brien. Now, as you'll know, Kerry is one of Australia's leading and most awarded journalists, commentators and writers, and we're very grateful that he continues to lead this event today. This is a difficult topic that we're tackling tonight, and before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge the survivors of domestic violence and their families who we know are present in the room tonight. I know that tonight's discussion will be challenging for some, confronting. If you need to leave to take a moment, please do that. There will be some counselling available after this session and you'll hear more about that at the end. Tonight we are going to discuss one of the most important issues for this country. One in four women in Australia has experienced violence from an intimate partner and on average one Australian woman a week and one man a month is killed. These issues tragically have been brought very close to home here on the Gold Coast in recent times. We only ever hear about a fraction of these devastating stories, but the tales that go unheard are every bit as important and as heartbreaking. To help explore this difficult but vital topic, we're honoured to be joined this evening by award-winning journalist and anti-domestic violence campaigner, Jess Hill. A former foreign correspondent, among many other reporting production roles at the ABC, Jess has reported exclusively on domestic abuse since 2014. Her years immersed in such stories have given her a unique insight into the seriousness of this social issue and we're really thankful that she's agreed to be our guest tonight. In her acclaimed first book, See What You Made Me Do, Jess investigates the reasons people are reluctant or unable to leave abusive partners. Released in 2019, See What You Made Me Do went on to win the 2020 Stella Prize as well as being shortlisted for several others, including the Walkley Book Award and the Prime Minister's Literary Award. Jess's book has since been adapted into a three-part documentary series, which many of you might have recently seen on SBS. The series is also available to stream on demand. It introduces us to survivors, victims and their families as it navigates the unpredictable and complex way in which abuse manifests and takes hold in relationships. Jess's book and the documentary are essential sources for anyone with an interest in how we can affect change at a societal level to address the issues that affect far too many people. Both Jess uh, and another audience member tonight, Rhys Carroll, have given generously of their time and committed to sharing their passion to end this violence by becoming ambassadors of the Griffith University's MATE program. MATE stands for Motivating Action Through Empowerment and is the work of researchers from Griffith University led by Sean Ross Smith and Professor Patrick O'Leary. The MAPE program works to raise awareness about abusive behaviour at a cultural level and offers training programs in the, event, in the prevention of violence. I encourage you to find out more about MAPE and Griffith's broader violence research prevention program and our staff who work tirelessly to produce research and best practice for addressing, understanding, controlling and preventing violence. We have a MATE project team here tonight who would gratefully welcome your support for their programs. And if you're interested in more information, you can go to their website or just stop by and pick up a brochure at the back of the room at the conclusion of this event. Now, would you please join with me in welcoming Jess and Kerry for tonight's conversation as they examine this complex, challenging, but critical issue. Thanks, Carolyn. And, uh... Jess and I actually worked together. We were colleagues at the ABC working on the 730 report a little over a decade ago, and it's a privilege for me 
to actually be sharing the stage with her here tonight. Oh. Jess, uh, congratulations. Congratulations on the book and the series and just the, the impactive body of your work. Thank so you, congratulations Gary. for that. Your book and your series have been enormously confronting on so many levels. But one of the most chilling images for me was your observation that apart from the military and the police, the family is the most violent group in our society. Mm. I just want to reflect on that for a moment right at the start because I think we all want to believe, don't we, that for all the testing moments, there is no structure in society that says sanctuary or safety mm. more than family. Mm. Yeah, and that line actually comes from the first national survey on family violence that was conducted in the United States in 1975. It was the first time that actually counted how many people were being subjected to this and that was the conclusion that the researchers reached. Um, and no matter how much new information we have about statistics, you know, prior to the 1980s, we used to think that um, it was about one in a million children have been sexually abused. Mm. And then it became like one in 80, one in 20, you know. Now it's, you know, it's unfortunately known to be much more prevalent. These statistics, um, they become more precise. It becomes more clear what the nature of violence is in the home. But you're right, like it's so, it, it interrupts what we need at an organismic level, this sanctuary, mm. um, this concept of sanctuary. Um, but it's true. It's true that, and, you know, you'll hear many feminists like we were talking about before, Jermaine Greer, she'd say the nuclear family is basically a breeding ground for violence. But what we've done in putting a, you know, typically a man and a woman or two people in a home with four walls around it, with children, with sometimes very little community around them, no longer that communal upbringing, that you are basically creating a pressure cooker situation um, and a lack of transparency in which this violence can flourish. And so we say now things happen behind closed doors. Well, traditionally, you know, prior to Western culture coming around or prior to the more, you know, industrial revolution, there was no closed doors, you know, mm. um, and but those closed doors have, yeah, led to a level of secrecy and, and also the need for us to maintain the idea of home as a sanctuary has made people who feel like they do not grow up in a sanctuary feel like freaks, feel like they are to blame because their family is not like everyone else's, um, when in fact this has become virtually normal. Yeah. I'm sure there are many people in the audience who have read your book uh, and or seen the documentaries, but just as a quick recap, to set up the rest of the conversation. Can you give us a summary, if you like, of the scale of the crisis? Mm. Sure. So, um, you know, there's some statistics that are really well known. Um, obviously, the one that that is very well known is one in four women will report having been sexually or physically assaulted by an intimate partner since the age of 15. <coughs> when I was writing the book, I really wanted to, you know, flesh out, well, what, what does one in four actually mean? And, and it means like around... 2.2 million women alive today. 2.1 million men and women will have seen their mother physically assaulted before the age of 15. Another 800,000 will see their father physically assaulted. Um, there are other statistics that do not relate directly to violence, but where we see this destruction start to move out into other areas of society. So the year that I started writing the book, which was 2016, 105,000 people who went to homelessness services, 96% women and kids, said that domestic abuse was the reason they sought help. Um, so as, you know, these statistics, even when we say 2.3 million women, 2.1 million men and women as kids, they don't actually, you know, it's still abstract. And we abstract these statistics because it's almost impossible to take on and retain a sense of, love and joy in our lives, if we were to really take on the reality of it, I found personally, mm. um, um, and also because it's impossible to really consider what that scale means. But I have to say, when I released the book two years ago now, 
I've been, done a lot of interviews. I pretty much have not stopped talking about it for two years. And the signing lines after events, the number of people who come up to me and talk about, you know, the most horrific times of their life from every single background, and Rosie Batty was not lying when she said family violence can affect anyone no matter how nice your house is, um, that has brought home to me the prevalence. Mm. There are so many aspects to it, and I want to break them down a bit. And also when we talk about domestic violence uh, or abuse, we invariably talk about heterosexual relationships, but, mm. of course, implicitly the discussion encompasses wider mm. uh, gender relationships. So... In terms of the types of offenders, there is a wide variety of perpetrators, is there mm. not, and a wide variety of victims. Mm. And I actually, I tend to think, like, when I was writing the book, I was trying to get my head around all of those questions that we ask. And, you know, I'm not an academic. Um, I actually didn't go to university. I'm just going to disclose. That's, um, so that's two of us. I, oh, good. See? All good people, no formal education. Um, so I'm, I'm like a total autodidact, um, which has its positives and its negatives. Um, I think it, it, I've probably had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about it, so I work very hard to make sure that I understand um, before I write anything. Um, and I, so I was asking all the questions that pretty much are like general public questions when I was writing the book, which is like, is there a victim type? you know, or what kinds of guys become perpetrators, you know, amongst many, many other questions. And what it came to was that actually it's much more important and interesting to look at what leads to someone perpetrating because actually what leads to someone being victimised, yes, there are people who are disproportionately affected and, yes, there, you could say that, you know, growing up in a violent household, those girls particularly who grew up in those households are disproportionately going to become victims later in life. Um, but actually, as I said, it's anybody. Um, and what I found most interesting about finding out about coercive control and the broad nature of it, not just in interpersonal relationships but in so many other contexts from prisoner of war camps to cults to um, sex trafficking rings, um, that you know, anybody who is subjected to that type of behaviour is likely to fall prey to it mm. and will have very similar responses um, because it is behaviour that somehow instinctively we know as humans will override the autonomy um, and the perspective of the person who it's subjected to. Mm. So the, the types of victims are less interesting. The types of perpetrators are very interesting and that is very important. And I think that at the moment we look at, peop at, at let's say, you know, men in, in the main who perpetrate domestic abuse and violence, we have men's behaviour change programs that sort of deal with them as a, as a homogenous type. But we know that we have a, a, a cohort of them that score very highly on antisocial personality disorders. doesn't mean they necessarily are disordered, but they, they definitely have very low ratings for empathy and compassion. Um, so they are very different offenders and they require different approaches. You put them in a room with other guys, um, you know, um, the majority of offenders who are not, don't have antisocial personality disorders but are, as we'll look at later, you know, beset by other seriously disordering kinds of emotional problems, um, they are going to totally run right over that group. They're going to collude with the facilitator. They're, they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to manipulate the whole process um, and they and they will use being you know having gone through the process as a way to get access to kids through family court as a way to torture their partners etc. Mm. But the the majority cohort are not those guys. The majority cohort are men who, when you speak to guys who've really gathered some self insight about their offending and have the possibility to reform, the commonality is that they had a, a, a huge degree of self loathing very well hidden, covered over by grandiosity and, and, and seeming narcissism, but at an almost total lack of self-love and an absolute belief that if the person they were with found out who they really were, they would leave. Which surely were formed in childhood. Um, to a degree, you know, and yes. I mean, you can, you can, have, you can have trauma or particular events that, can, that might, might lead you further down a particular path, mm. but... But surely if you arrive in a situation as a relatively stable, emotionally stable human being, mm. you are less likely to be tipped over an edge. 
Boyhood is inherently traumatising. I found that. <laughs> you would have, especially you know, when you were growing up. As a up. Christian brother's boy, I most certainly oh, did. Carrie, but do go on. Should yeah. I do the interview? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you know it's one of the most interesting conversations I had was with um, this family therapist from the States, Terry Real, who talks about the normal traumatisation of boys. And when he says normal, he means that every boy will go through this. How they respond as they grow older is up to every individual, but they mm. will have to resist mm. what this normal traumatisation process is. Mm. And what it is is a process by which they learn that they must split and that one half of themselves is to be held in contempt and it's the half that we define as feminine, yeah. um, the half that may be intuitive, compassionate, vulnerable, emotional. You know, boys to this day, even though we don't sort of you know, do the whole boys don't cry thing as, as much of an absolute rule, the one rule of masculinity stands today, which is you must be strong. You must not be weak and you must show that you're in control. Mm. And then we wonder why coercive control is such a massive problem in Australia and in other countries. We're actually socialising boys into it. And what's awful, I think, from a parent's perspective, even if you are raising your boy to be sensitive and understanding and trying to raise them even like gender neutral as some people do, you know. Um, they go to school, they enter this milieu and they will receive the, sh the shaming responses to kill off those parts of themselves or at least to attempt to kill off those mm. parts of themselves regardless. And parents will see their little boys turn from boys who adore their mums, you know, who are really soft, gentle boys holding hands with other boys and little girls to, as Tim Winton put it, like donning this kind of awful cloak of misogyny, you know, not all boys, but enough for yeah. it to be a really serious social problem. And we're so inured to it that we just see it as unavoidable. And I think what the Me Too movement and, and other ancillary movements around it have done is to say, this is not, this should not be normal. It is massively problematic and it is leading to the corrosion of our society. Mm. I'm going to come back to shame and I'm going to come back to the, to the point mm. about how boys grow up a little bit later. I want to get into coercion now. Mm. I mean, we, I suppose what we most know about domestic violence is, or domestic abuse is outbursts of violence mm. and they might be isolated outbursts of violence or they might be repeat patterns of violence, mm. um, but the one that uh, strikes me as 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 um, particularly uh, insidious is coercion, mm. because as you describe it, it seems to me it's a creeping process, mm -hmm. and that the person who is the target for the coercion may not even be aware of it for a long time. Mm. Even the person who's perpetrating it may not be aware that that's what they're doing. Because they're not all consciously manipulative people, are no. they? No. And, and, in fact, that's what's so confounding about coercive control is that you'll have a group of perpetrators who will actually be able to describe to you exactly the steps by which they, they manage to coerce and control their partner and others who will see themselves operating in response to what their partner did to them. Mm. So the victim complex amongst perpetrators is nuclear, like these guys will stand in the doorway, even with their partner standing bloodied and bruised behind them and, and claim the victim status to police. Um, they, 90%, I was told, 90% of the callers to men's line um, will claim to be the victim up front and by the end of the phone call it'll be around 10% once they've worked through actually what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I think that the unconscious nature of it, how it can operate in a lot of relationships, it often starts off, I mean, first of all, it starts off usually with an intense whirlwind of a romance and a fast-tracked commitment. Um, this is just a general, um, it's not yeah. always, but this is just a generalisation. Um, once that commitment is secured, a lot of people will find that the abuse starts at times when you would never imagine, right after wedding day, on the wedding night, during pregnancy or when the baby is born, you know, at these times of commitment. And a part of that is because a controlling person, once that commitment is secured, in their head, the only person who is deciding that this commitment ends is them. 
So there's a level of comfort that, that arrives at a time of commitment where they can start to be much more upfront. So it becomes a sense of ownership. <laughs> it becomes a sense of ownership and a sense of what is deserved. Yeah. Yes. So literally you hear stories where a guy can turn on a dime from being, you know, fully supportive of that woman's independence, of gender equality, looking like the perfect husband and like one woman who spoke to me turned on a dime the day she announced she got pregnant, literally became the total image of a coercive controller um, and she spent the next 18 months trying to manage him like a psych patient. She wasn't actually a nurse or a, a, I should say she's actually a doctor. Um, thinking that this was an aberration, that the man that she met, that remember she was with, I didn't think she was even married to him, but the man that she met and knew and fell in love with, that was the real person and the other was an aberration. And the number of women who stay because they believe themselves to be the strong person and that they, they are the only ones who can fix this man, I can't, I've lost count. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, yeah. So, so to, to more graphically illustrate the extent of coercive control, can you briefly talk us through the Rowan Baxter coercive behaviour uh, with his wife, his partner, Hannah Clark? Yeah. So this case really woke Australia up to the nature of coercive control. I think prior to that, I mean, um, this was in February 2020. Um, personally, I'd been speaking about coercive control for just a few months prior to that. The domestic violence sector had been talking about power and control for decades. But when Hannah and her three children were murdered by Rowan Baxter, it shocked the nation in much the same way that the murder of Luke Batty did. And in much the same way that Rosie stepped out onto that street that, that day and fronted the media and didn't stop, Sue and Lloyd Clark have done much the same. Um, I think it's a reason why Queensland is leading the way in legislating against coercive control. Um, and what they did, they knew that, that relationship almost intimately. They knew what Rowan had been subjecting Hannah to. They'd been trying to talk to Hannah about it. You know, sorts of things that Rowan did was he would isolate Hannah from friends and family. He would tell her what she was and wasn't allowed to wear. He would prevent her from accessing food, sleep. You know, he would induce that debility and exhaustion in her so that was that feeling that just getting by on an hour-to-hour -hour level was a matter of psychological survival. He would destroy his kids' toys as punishment for them not putting them away. He'd use surveillance on her phone to track her. He would turn up when she'd be out at a cafe and just stand outside and menace. He would expect sex virtually every night and if he didn't get it, he would sulk and he would stonewall the entire family. And I must say, this is why I've really gone towards using the term domestic abuse. Much like child abuse includes neglect, domestic abuse, one of the most horrible behaviours that perpetrators use is stonewalling, literally going quiet like this menacing presence in the house where nobody knows what's coming next. Um, so Rowan would use those techniques and behaviours. He'd also threatened to kill his previous wife and son, um, which is an, a absolute, not just a, it's a raging red flag about future violence. Um, so all of these, all of these behaviours together are like a textbook for coercive control. And when it's, it's interesting when you, when you list behaviours like that, What's so weird about coercive control is how predictable it is. And it's when people say, well, like, you know, it's, it's covert behaviour, how can you really identify it, how can you codify it? It's like these stories are so predictable and they run along a plot line so similar that anyone who spent any amount of time in this sector can almost finish a woman's story before she's halfway through telling it. How closely have you looked at at the, the education of police to coercion, to the role of coercion? Because I, I know in one of your recent forums uh, there was a senior police officer, I think it might have been New South Wales, who said that something like 80% of the cases they handled is that coercive control was a part of the abuse. That was actually Ben on oh. Insight on oh. the, the other night. Um, right. 107,000 call-outs and over 80% 
uh, in, including features of coercive control. Right. Um, so, 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 so how how long has that has it taken for police to actually see with clarity how coercive control is a really fundamental and, and significant part of the whole um, process and and syndrome of domestic abuse? Well, the shortest answer is too long, um, and the long answer is that our justice system has been built around policing incidents. So the motivation to, for police to have that education around coercive control has not really been reflected in their job description, you know, which is to go to an incident, find out who is at fault, is there something to charge, and maybe is there an intervention order that we want to put in place. But because we've had this incident-based system, it has to a large extent concealed the true nature of what the vast majority of people, especially who seek help from either domestic violence services or from police, are experiencing. And what that means is that when police traditionally have turned up at an incident, there's so much that doesn't make sense to them. And I understand because when I first started studying this and I was coming at it through that incident-based framework, I couldn't understand victim behaviour until you understand how coercive control works on a person and also how the system responds to coercive control and victim survivors are often acutely sensitive to what will happen if they leave, you can't understand why a woman will press charges one day and withdraw the next. It's annoying. You know, to police who are not well-versed in this, those people are just getting in the way of them doing their jobs. Those police are turning up at court. That person is, the person who was crying at the call out last night is now sitting with the perpetrator and saying, this cop is a bastard. We never wanted to be here. So because police have not understood that their response to these incidents or call outs is part of a process that women particularly, but anybody who's being subjected to this, will go through a process of leaving that is like a game of snakes and ladders and that part of that is establishing trust in the system before they jump into whatever safety net's being held out for them, there is just going to be this frustration. And no matter how much they even understand coercive control, until they understand why victims make certain choices, until they understand what their role is in providing safety, until they respond with a protective approach, it, they will continue to fail in responding to this crisis. Is there a template? in the world where coercive control uh, is accepted, clearly accepted in the justice system, uh, and that there is a pattern of for investigation and process and building the case for prosecution and responsiveness from the courts. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, um, it's early days still, but, you know, Scotland has been held up as the standard. Yeah. Um, it's, it's held up for a number of reasons, because of the time it took to write the legislation, collaboration with victim survivors, not just adults, but kids, um, with legislators, the, the amount of time that went into implementation, training, cultural reform, which is not perfect by any stretch, um, but has shifted the dial considerably. But also because unlike other offences that had come before it in England and Wales, um, they actually listed the behaviours for police to look for. So they listed isolation from friends and family, tracking through surveillance devices, um, threats to abuse or harm um, a pet or a child, threats to harm themselves as a way to stop the victim from leaving, and other really complex things like <clears throat> coercing the victim to engage in illegal activities in order to stop them from disclosing the abuse. In other words, to use it as a form of blackmail. Exactly. Mm. To, to make it so that they are complicit in the illegality. Mm. So that is the list that they've got in the Scottish legislation means that police have very concrete things to look for. Um, the way that evidence is gathered is through text messages, financial records, photos on phones if there's been assaults, testimony from friends and family, if there still are friends and family around to give that, to, to attest to isolation. 
so much evidence that the specialist prosecutor in Scotland said that the vast majority of cases that came before the courts, the offender pled guilty because the evidence was so conclusive so it did not even go to trial and the victim therefore did not have to go on the stand mm. and endure what is a secondarily traumatising process. Okay. So how do you assess the response of governments around Australia to define coercion as a, coercion as a crime with a, backed up by significant prison sentences? So it's a complicated question. Um, the question's simple, I'm sure. The, the question is simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there is necessarily caution. And people tend to use the comparison between the, um, the one punch or coward punch legislation in New South Wales that, that saw King's Cross shut down and said, like, you know, two young boys were killed and within a month we had a, a, a you know, change in laws. It's actually like a really bad response though and like killed off a whole business sector so maybe a bit of time would have been better. Um, so I don't think we want to do that in coercive control legislation. I think that we've what Scotland has done is shown us that they wanted to legislate back in 2015 but they took four years to do it because it is difficult mm. and you need to take a whole system with you. So Queensland has committed to criminalising coercive control their task force actually just um, put out a uh, paper today on That's the right. options around it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they're also doing a review of how, the, how women intersect with the criminal justice system. Fantastic. Like that's what advocates are asking for. They don't want just laws. They want and this to be the, start, the bring, bringing of a whole new lens to the systemic response. In New South Wales... The inquiry into criminalising has completed. That's going to re report on the 30th of June. There seems to be quite a bit of momentum there. It's likely, I think, that they will criminalise. In Victoria, um, almost no momentum um, to criminalise, despite the fact that, you know, to date they've been the most advanced. Yes. Um, they, they, because of the Royal Commission, the Royal Commission did not recommend criminalising coercive control, but it was conducted in 2015. Yeah. And it was only first criminalised in England and Wales in 2015. Right. We have a lot more field evidence now yeah. for how this works. Yeah. But in every state and territory in the, in the country, there is a discussion. Right. And that has come in the space of about a year. Okay. All right. Queensland is interesting, isn't it? Because there's a, a woman who's Premier. Half the Cabinet are women. Mm. The Attorney General and Justice Minister is a woman. Uh, and the government is intent, as you say, on, on criminalising coercion and has established a 10-year plan to end domestic violence based on recommendations from a special task force uh, in 2015. Yet the point, at the point when Gold Coast mother Kelly Wilkinson was set on fire allegedly and killed by her former partner a month ago, after going to police for help, the police themselves have acknowledged, I think, twice, um, uh, we hear from other sources that she went many times mm. looking for help. There were fewer than 90 domestic violence specialist police officers in Queensland to handle 107,000 cases in the last year. Is there a disconnect there between what the government is committed to on paper and what is happening in practice? Mm. Is five years not yet enough time to judge the effectiveness and seriousness of their policies out of that task force report? Mm. I think that policing is obviously key. It's not the only part. The courts are a very big part of this in mm. terms of the actual legislation and response. But just to take policing, um, you know, we've come out of a time, the 80s, you know, and 90s, we started these sort of more pro-arrest policies or, or um, uh, not mandatory arrest but pro-arrest. Um, so it, it went from police almost universally saying this is just a domestic drive on, um, to having to attend and having to respond. That had some unintended consequences around women being misidentified as perpetrators um, and it's certainly not short of its critics, you know, the use of the criminal justice system in response to domestic violence. But certainly, you know, the victim survivors that I've spoken to who, who engage or want to engage with the criminal justice system are quite happy that it's there, even with all of its flaws. Um, What's happened, I think, is that slowly over the last 10 years, 
the reporting rates to police have increased quite exponentially because of the enormous amount of awareness that has been growing in the community, because of the advertising campaigns to report, encouraging women to jump into that safety net that is supposed to be there. So on the one hand, we're encouraging this, but on the other hand, the resourcing is simply not matching the demand. Well, I think that the paradigm shift in policing and government hasn't matched the awareness campaigns. Mm. So domestic violence has become core business for police. In some, you know, in Victoria at least, it's 40 to 60% of police time. That is extraordinary. And yet you still have a large number of police who don't think it's proper policing. And the, the analogy that I've run is that if you had a large number of firefighters who attended a grass fire and went, I reckon it'll burn out on its own, just leave it. Just, why don't we just separate it? from that enormous tract of bushland, we'll build a little fence and, and it'll be fine. Our country would have been reduced to ash. And unfortunately, our country is being reduced to a type of ash because that's the approach that police have. They see these incremental improvements in policing and think we're doing much better. But I want to take it as though let's like arrive from Mars we see that the police force has, the, its core business is domestic violence. It's not doing a very good job there. Like at what point do we say, unless you deal with the fundamental cultural problems in policing, racism, the number of perpetrators that you have in the police force that are, remain employed and not charged and protected by police unions, all of these issues unless they are dealt with, maybe you should not be funded to respond to this crisis. We need some kind of law enforcement, and this is why in the series looked at the alternative of women's police stations, because after the fascist dictatorships in Latin America, they realised, well, police can't actually respond to gendered violence. They were actually the perpetrators of gendered violence for the whole time, you know, of, the, of these dictatorships. So they created a totally separate force which was purely about protecting victims mm. with the powers of police, you know. Yeah. But so, but they're, they're really serious questions we have to ask. Yeah. Can police do this job? And and it, and it is an incredibly difficult job. I mean, I've I've and particularly for police who aren't properly prepared for it. Absolutely. And who are um, under great stress from the range of demands that are on them. Mm. Um, and, and I've seen many situations where police have been placed in the most extraordinary circumstances mm. and have dealt with it extremely well there are many, amazing, many times. There are amazing police, and I want to really make that clear, yeah. that there are police who dedicate their lives to helping victims that go way above and beyond. Um, and the women that I speak to who've been helped by police like that, they saved their lives. There's no question. The problem is the front desk lottery and that when a woman is ready to leap out or, or call police because actually she's got no other choice, or police are called by a neighbour, yeah. the fact that you don't know who you're going to get is inexcusable. And just quickly touch on, because I want to, there's an awful lot to, to get through, uh, I just want to quickly touch on what is, what is nonetheless one of the most important aspects of all of this, and that is the number of times where the woman who is the victim ends up being labelled as the perpetrator. Yeah, that's right. Um, there are all sorts of reasons for that. Sometimes um, I heard recently from um, Chloe McArdle, who I interviewed recently, was also on Insight with Ben. Um, the police just got a story from the perpetrator. Chloe wasn't there to, you know, wasn't there at that moment to counter that story, was also too scared to say it in the, in the presence of the perpetrator. Um, and so she got the seven-day eviction notice. So she had to leave the house. I mean, she'd been coercively controlled by this man for years in a way that she was terrified. Um, that action from police so unseated her sense of justice and protection that she actually had to leave the state. She feels like she could no, she could no longer live in Victoria. Um, so sometimes, and when she asked for an explanation, they said, well, at least you were separated. And for them it didn't matter who had been identified as the perpetrator. And, and if in, in, in all of this they're also 
Uh, they've got little or no resources. They're leaving the house behind. They're facing possible homelessness. They might not be able to get into a shelter. Uh, I mean, um, if you're misidentified as a perpetrator for numerous reasons, whether it be that you were using self-defence um, and, and your perpetrator had a more calm and considered story because you are in the process of trauma, maybe you're a bit aggressive, which is what trauma will do to you, um, maybe you were using violent resistance, maybe you had been subjected to the worst kind of abuse for 10 years and one day you picked up a pole and you flogged him. You know, like if that was um, a hostage situation, we would applaud that woman and go, fucking good on you. <laughs> and instead we arrest her and we criminalise her. Mm. And this happens disproportionately to Indigenous women who feel like a lot of Indigenous women feel like they have no choice but to use violent resistance because they can't rely on the systems. If they call police, they will be, as mandatory reporters, they will call the Department of Communities and Justice and their kids will be removed. Um, the effect of this on women is incalculable and it is, again, inexcusable. It's also very much, I think, down to the fact that we have an incident-based system where police turn up and say, what's just happened? Not how did we get to this point? Yeah. So when you mention Indigenous women, you're instantly going to the extra layers of complexity around the colonial legacy and the continuing mm -hmm. racism of the justice system. Mm -hmm. And you've just got to look at the raw numbers uh, on Indigenous incarceration, uh, that the racism, the embedded racism in the institutions of justice is profound. Yes. And so one assumes that it is equally profound as it relates to the treatment by police of domestic violence involving Indigenous women well, and look children. At, look at the Tamika Mullaly case. Um, Just very quickly go to that. So Tamika had been terribly violently assaulted by her partner, Mervyn Bell, in public, on a public street. She'd sought some safety in a garage. She was, he had stripped her naked. She was covered in a sheet. It was covered in blood. There was a call to triple zero from the nurse who was sheltering her. Um, that nurse called triple zero because Mervyn was threatening both of them and she felt she had no choice. Um, police arrive just a moment after Tamika's father arrives at the scene. Tamika is massively affected by trauma. She doesn't want police to be there. She is a woman in, living in Broome in WA. She's an Aboriginal woman living in Broome. She's had a history with how, pol how police respond to Aboriginal people. She doesn't want police there. So she may have used some spicy language to tell them to go away. Um, police say that she, um, that she spat or she, she, um, she did something of that nature. Um, and then they proceeded to arrest her. Um, they didn't just, they tackled her to the ground they also, once she was running um, away from them, she climbed into her dad's ute. They tried to break the windshield to get to her. This is a woman who has obviously been very terribly assaulted. They arrest her. She's there with her 10-month-old baby, Charlie. The police hand the baby to two girls who were there at the scene, not having any understanding of their relationship to Tamika or to the person who's just assaulted her. Tamika's father, Ted, feels he's got no choice but to let Charlie go with the girls because he has to make sure that Tamika is not going to be a death in custody. The police are refusing to take her to hospital and Ted's absolutely insisting he can't take Charlie with him. He follows the police to the hospital. While he's at the hospital making sure Tamika gets attended to, and by the way, doctors say she would have died in custody had she not been treated, Mervyn Bell goes around to the girl's place and takes Charlie. Ted goes, as soon as Tamika's being taken care of, he races around to the girl's place to go and pick up baby Charlie, finds out that he's been abducted. Ted goes straight back to the hospital and says, you've got to help me. He's taken off with my grandson. He's going to kill my grandson. And the police officer sitting outside the hospital says, how many cars do you reckon we've got here? He says, we've got two, mate. We've got one here. And we've got one back at the station. And as Ted says later, he found out the one back at the station was doing paperwork on Tamika's arrest. Ted went to that police station numerous times that night and begged them to find his grandson. He was convinced that Mervyn would kill him. He called triple zero 
and we had the recording, mm. it's very clear how lucid Ted is. It is clear how calm he is in a way that I would challenge any one of us to be as calm and present as Ted was. And yet the police said that he was drunk. He hadn't drunk in 20 years. Mervyn had Charlie for 16 hours. There was no alert sent out until it was far too late. Mervyn walked into a roadhouse, the Fortescue Roadhouse, with, with baby Charlie in his arms and, and said that he was dead. Okay. You know, and the worst part of that story, if you could possibly imagine there being a worse part, is that after baby Charlie ends up being murdered, and I won't go into the details because no. it is truly shocking, the police pursued charges against Tamika and Ted for resisting arrest and they were convicted. And the judge described Ted as the most upstanding witness he had ever seen in the witness box and yet Ted walks away with a criminal record. And when police said to Ted that night, mate, are you playing the race card? Ted did not even know what that meant because to him and his family, he thought police were there to help him. He didn't even think that he would be prejudiced against because he was Aboriginal because he saw himself as an upstanding member of the business community and deserving of help like anyone else. You said in one discussion, my rage over the injustice of this, broadly, has many times overwhelmed me. Tell me about that impact on you because you've really immersed yourself, really mm. immersed yourself in this. So every day that I was writing that book, I would cry every day for almost four years, often alone. Um, I was really lucky to have my partner, uh, who's a psychotherapist, even more helpful. Um, <clears throat> um, now, he, was, his, was his path uh, um, influenced by where you were No, doing? he had already moved into that area, but okay. his practice is definitely influenced Okay. by the ongoing study of this subject and yeah. many of, of his clients are either perpetrators or victims. Right. Um, so we have a feedback loop going on there. It's fun times at our place at yeah. night, you know, uh, <laughs> going over our day's activities. Um, I think that because I did not come through um, academia, I didn't come through like a traditional sort of um, understanding of feminism, I had to spend the first year getting a, a hold of, the nature of patriarchy, the history of oppression. And to be honest, I was a very angry person for a lot of that and I was using my own home as a Petri dish. So I was looking to poor David's uh, behaviour and saying like, that that's entitlement, isn't it? That's what that looks <laughs> like. Right, let's have a chat. Um, and it, it is an impossible environment for a husband to um, operate in, I have to say. And this is a man who did, was the only man in a gender studies class in Sydney University. So he was the best equipped you could possibly be, um, but, but no one can be yeah. equipped properly. But then, um, but then after talking about the rage, you mm. say you've turned around and tried to see domestic abuse through the eyes of the perpetrators, to see them as complex humans with their own needs and sensitivities and found it so difficult it sometimes made you feel ill. Yes, and there's a reason why most people don't work with victims and perpetrators because it feels like you're having to divide yourself in two, um, it can feel like an act of disloyalty to the victim to see the perpetrator as a whole person. What it, it took me a long time, and this is again a lot through um, the assistance of David who was seeing some of these men and was really imploring me to get past that, that well understandable rage to understand these guys as three-dimensional complex creatures. And what I realised was that the greatest act of loyalty I could, I could give to those victim survivors was to better understand these men and why they do it and how to stop them. Seeing them as two-dimensional characters or foot soldiers of patriarchy or men who just do it for power and privilege or any of the you know, number of kind of glib statements that have been used to describe men's violence for years was not getting us to the heart of the issue. Um, and I think that <sighs> James Gilligan, who was a prison psychiatrist in the States, put it really well when he said, to condemn, just simply condemn violence is the same, like, like condemning heart disease. 
or cancer. Or yeah. cancer. It's not going to cure it. Yeah. Now, sense of entitlement and where it comes from. Eva Cox has said that it's not how do we stop men from doing that to us, but how do we stop men feeling that they're entitled to do it? Mm. What do you take from that? I mean, it's, it's sort of to what you're saying. But, it's a key. But, but it's, entitlement. I come back to that quote a lot, actually. Um, and this is the thing, like when we talk about there are a lot of men in our society who carry deep-seated feelings of shame, um, who feel like they can't talk about their emotions, all of the things that we sort of talk about when we talk mm. about perpetrators, who would never for one moment feel entitled to take that out on the yep. people that they are supposed to love. The entitlement piece is, is absolutely key. One um, former perpetrator I spoke to who's in the first chapter of the book, Rob Sanassi, he said that a big part of his pathway out of coercive control was to relinquish entitlement so entirely that he felt entitled to almost nothing at all. Um, it was like going cold turkey um, and entering like, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, but Entitlement Anonymous, um, where he would let, basically let his wife say or do anything for a period almost just to, A, let her have her say for the first time, but B, learn what it was like to not step in and have, his, have to have his needs met mm. or believe that that was his right. Um, the giving up of, in, of that overblown sense of entitlement is incredibly difficult because perpetrators are nothing if not massively self-centred. Yeah, no, you mentioned shame. You devote a chapter of your book to shame <clears throat> and, you, and you quote Salman Rushdie at the top. Between shame and shamelessness lies the axis upon which we turn. Meteorological conditions at both these poles are of the most extreme, ferocious type. Shamelessness, shame, the roots of violence. Mm. Can we talk about the part that shame plays in all of this mm. with regard to both perpetrator and victims? Well, let's take shamelessness for the smaller cohort first. And, and they're the guys we were talking earlier about, you know, who have those antisocial sort of personality disorders. And this... Um, Forensic investigator, homicide reviewer from Arizona, Neil right. Websdale, you know, he was saying that there are some guys who he would interview after a homicide in jail and he would ask them about the experience of killing and they would say that they felt it as a type of transcendent experience, that it was almost a type of spiritual experience. Jesus. So there are those men who operate with extremely low bandwidths of any type of shame, if, if any, um, but they are in the minority. Uh, and the majority of guys, and this is, again, what, what Websdale found, when you look back to their lives and their childhoods, they were steeped in shame. They were steeped in a kind of compromised masculinity. Um, what shame does to someone when it is deeply buried, and I'll talk about in a moment how yeah. that is then expressed, but that feeling of absolute unlovability, of deep self-loathing that may never rise to a cognitive surface but becomes a knowledge of oneself such that when some of these guys, you know, these guys grow up, feeling this type of, of shame, they can create this carefully constructed mask. It could be of like the tough guy, the gentleman, the human rights activist, any type of mask that they've chosen. And they keep, they're able to keep that on in almost every circumstance, in their workplace, at school. But when it comes to an intimate relationship and the woman that they're with wants to go backstage and see what's behind the mask, that's when they start to feel the sense of irritation and then the rage starts to build. And, and at first they don't even know how to explain it and they may apologise for it and they may mean it in the moment that they apologise. But it's too difficult to sit with that feeling of being apologetic because actually what's happening there is a feeling that they are entitled to not feel this way. They should not have to feel vulnerable and they should not have to feel afraid 
which is what so many perpetrators below their sense of anger and control mm. say that they are fearing. Because, because that sense of vulnerability would scare them, wouldn't it? I mean, it doesn't, that in, doesn't that incite fear? If you feel vulnerable and you feel a, a threat, no matter how strange that threat might sound to somebody outside their own fury. But particularly if you subscribe to pretty closely to the rules of masculinity, which say that you're not yeah. allowed to feel vulnerable. Well, let's talk about this now. Gloria Steinem. This was an interview I did with her when she was in her 70s for Late Line in the 90s. It would be very helpful to put it mildly. If children, She might have only been in the 60s and the 90s. It would be very helpful to put it mildly if children understood that men could be as loving and nurturing as women because without that, our early experience causes us to believe that only women can be loving, nurturing, patient, empathetic, all of the qualities that are necessary to raise kids, qualities that are wrongly called feminine. Until we experience men doing that when we're little, we're going to go on dividing up our natures and saying if we're little boys, we can't be those things, which of course is a libel on men, and if we're little girls, we have to be those things. You know, if you haven't seen a deer, you won't recognise a deer. Mm. And if you haven't seen loving and nurturing men, you think that that's not masculine. Precisely. And this is, goes back to the what we talk about before, the splitting or the binary, you know, where this whole idea, and this is what um, Terry Real calls the dance of contempt, where we're basically you are seeing boys being raised with ideas that to be a girl is to be a, 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 is, is a, a thing of contempt. Being a boy is not being a girl. And now, I swear that you, you, it's now a kind of a very prevalent culture in, at teenage level. It's just such a commonplace thing for boys to refer to girls as sluts and to sort of categorise girls in different varieties that relate to absolutely nothing that's to do with their humanity or their character or their personality even. Yeah, and, and, the, and yet at the same time you've got these other strands of, you know, gender queerness and of, you know, and of increasing sensitivity in some young yes. boys. It's, yes. there is, it's like we're living in multiple eras all at once and they're all active sort of alongside one another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the issue around the splitting of boys is that there's two things. A, it's fundamentally unnatural to have to exile half of yourself. Like the, mm. the idea that we could have a coherent society in which we raise boys like that is nuts. Yes. Um, and, they, and the way that boys get programmed with this is, is gradually, it happens very early around the age of three or four, they start getting these messages that if you show vulnerability, if you show emotion, if you're soft, that you are going to be in danger. And, you know, it's one of the main quotes that really led me to understand this issue and where men were coming from was that famous Margaret Atwood quote, which is, you know, women, men are afraid women will laugh at them and women are afraid men will kill them. Yes. And, you know, for a long time I'd seen that quote pop up and think like, oh, isn't that ridiculous, you know, and it shows just how obscene that comparison is. But when I started really looking at, at perpetration, I was like, let's take that quote seriously. Why are men so afraid that women will laugh at them? They're afraid at what that emasculation will leave them vulnerable to, mm. and it leaves them vulnerable to other men's violence. The, you know, the primary... So there's a really primitive fear in there. Well, the primary enforcers of patriarchy are other men. Yeah. And in the book we talk about, like, there's a group of um, perpetrators in a men's behaviour change group and they're talking about shame. They make shame an actual character in the room and they, they put shame in a support group in a broom closet outside. And, um, and, and the facilitator asked them, what does shame look like? And the men said, it looks like another man. Hmm. She thought he'd, they'd say, oh, it looks like my mum or, it, you know, it looks like my, my ex-wife. But it was another man. That was who they were measuring themselves against. And so if you're laughed at by a woman, if you're disrespected by a woman, if you're cheated on by a woman, especially if she goes off with another man, then you are now vulnerable in the pecking order to other men. Okay, now, this, what is happening now is what I desperately wanted to avoid, but there are too, <laughs> too many things I wanted to cover. Uh, I do want to come back to policing, what, 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 what the future of policing should be like in relation to domestic abuse. Um, we know about, uh, and you have explored, the, the, the nature and the, and the effectiveness of having all women police stations in Brazil and Argentina in, relate, in relation to domestic uh, abuse. Mm. 
um, and and there's the there's the Scotland experience, uh, and and in fact, I mean, what we're really talking about, of, of course, there's criminality there, but what what these things are reflecting, as you have revealed in this conversation, are social welfare issues. They mm. are they are issues of um, the nature of relationships between men and women. They mm. are really complicated things beyond a burglar breaking a window and coming into a house and stealing your jewellery. Mm. So, so uh, is there a mood in Australia that you are discerning mm. that opens us up to a fairly rapid acceptance of the need that there has to be a radical reform of police culture and police structure in relation to domestic abuse? Ben? Um, <laughs> um, I think that there is a mood, yes. Um, the mood Are has, you convinced of the need? Oh, 100%. Yes. Um, you know, yes, we have a situation in which 20% of victims who are experiencing abuse right now have ever called police. It's a minority. That doesn't count the women who've left and are calling police for help. More women would call police if they felt they could trust the systems that would then step in to respond, including the police themselves. Um, not all women will ever need to call police or want to call police and involve them in their personal circumstances. But for the women that do and for the women who need that level of power to step in to overpower the power of the perpetrator, the need to reform policing and change the nature of policing is extreme and urgent. Um, the questions that arise are, is, is policing as it is currently structured even fit for this purpose? Um, and that's why we start to look at these alternative models. Um, how can we offer protection, especially in these cases that, that show high risk of homicide, how can we do that reliably? Can we do it with the current system? I don't know. I don't know if police are reformable. That, that's my honest answer. Um, what I do know is that police aren't going away, that we cannot abolish police and prisons tomorrow, that police, people will continue to call police, and in many circumstances, they will actually get a measure of increased safety. That's what we see from international research, that when police enter the house, quite often you're seeing a reduction in the ongoing nature of violence. Mm. Um, but it really depends on the response. And the fact that there is that inconsistency, we have to make a paradigm shift in this country to say that what's happening is, is not just not good enough, but needs to be absolutely fundamentally overhauled in order to protect the enormous numbers of women and children particularly who are being subjected to it. So you've got this happening in parallel with what we might call the, 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 the Grace Tame um, field. Mm. And it's, uh, it's been amazing. We had Grace Tame here two sessions ago. Mm. And there are these kind of parallel, the, the, there are these connected issues, aren't there? Mm. Um, so so the, the, the question is that, that the that the impetus for change has to be sustained. Mm. Sadly, in this field, it's being sustained by the ongoing reporting mm. of the, these awful cases. But it has to be about resourcing and it has to be a changed mindset, does it not? Yeah. And, and is, should it be clear to anybody in this country who looks that from the Brazil experience and the Argentina experience, these things not only work but they demand to be done here? I think so, and it doesn't have to be that we just replicate what gets done overseas. Like, why not have specialist police stations, um, say, in, in communities where there's high Indigenous populations, staffed by primarily Indigenous women? Or why not have those cultural, like, cultural diversity reflected in the police rather than what is now predominantly a white male police force? Yeah, but, you, but, you know, even the attempts to, to encourage more and more Indigenous people into policing there are, we're hearing too many cases of Indigenous police who last for a time mm. but are so, um, so assailed by the racism towards them within the force mm. that they leave. Because they're brought into a racist culture. Yeah. What the specialist police stations Which in Argentina... Which does not mean that all police are racist. No, of course, no, but there's a, an overarching culture that still has that, you know, very strongly. What the specialist police stations did in Argentina... 
they weren't actually related to police. They don't even report to the police minister. You know, they, they are totally mandated to prevent and respond to gendered violence. They're quite separate to police. They have the same powers. But so the answer is not just to take women police out of the police force and put them in a station. No. The answer is to actually create a force that, that has a totally separate and different culture because at the moment, unless police can show us that in the space of, you know, a short amount of time, they are capable of reform, they are capable of flushing out the perpetrators in their own force, much like the Wood Royal Commission Fitzgerald did with the corrupt police. You know, maybe we need another Royal Commission into police, but this time to look at offenders of interpersonal violence, to look at police who are on record for racist responses. Because I think some of the, the problem with Fitzgerald and with Wood is that the police that were left see themselves as squeaky clean and that, you know, we survived the, the routing and so we're the good ones. Well, that's not the case because nobody looked at interpersonal violence. No one looked at perpetration in the police force. And what we know is that in the States, 40% of male police officers in one large survey reported using interpersonal violence against their spouse or kids in the previous six months. That is so disproportionate. We don't have figures for Australia, but we do know that it is a major problem that perpetrators within the police force are protected, often by police unions and by the police themselves. There is a brotherhood code. It's very difficult to reform that. Um, so I understand when people say that they think that police can't be reformed. I would really like police to show us how they can do it, how they are committed to doing it, but it's going to take some bravery and some real courage in order to actually get the changes that we need. And we're out of time, but, uh, but we haven't even really looked. We haven't taken your wonderful microscope uh, to the justice system beyond the police mm. where the cases actually get into the courts and there are, you know, that can, that can be another whole horror story. Absolutely. Uh, as I said at the start, Jess, this has been a privilege to talk with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you. Um, I'm Ned Pankhurst, I'm Chair of the Hotter Board, uh, and it's my privilege tonight on behalf of uh, Home of the Arts and Griffith University to uh, express my thanks and our thanks to Jess and Kerry for um, uh, sharing the conversation with us. Um, I, I was thinking of how to actually sum up uh, what's been a, a, a thoroughly um, startling uh, and, and uh, quite challenging evening, and I'm actually going to use some words by others, Jess, which you'll recognise. Um, they're actually written about the book, um, but they're germane to the live narrative. And I, I thought they did a better job than anything I might say. And you'll recognise the quotes, I'm sure. And one says, domestic abuse is hard to write about, hard to read about, hard to think about, and everything in our culture makes silence the easy option. And you've articulated that very clearly tonight. And the quote goes on to say, breaking the silence takes skill and courage, and Jess Hill has both. And you've demonstrated that to us. Thank you very much. A second quote, which made me even more thoughtful, it says, Jess Hill is a brave woman. Her book gives us a chance, just a slim one, to shift our thinking on domestic violence past the stalemate we're in. But what I've heard tonight is that you've made it clear it's more than just a chance if we want it to be. And I think, again, for that, we thank you because we're indebted for you bringing that clarity to the conversation. You also made it exquisitely clear that there's no excuse for us not to fix this. So thank you again, Akeri and Jess. Uh, that's been a, a, a stunning evening to be part of. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> and as uh, Professor Evans uh, mentioned at the outset, uh, we have counsellors available at the back of the room for anyone who would uh, like to have a conversation. And, and just to finish some upcoming installments in the series, uh, Sunday, 4th of July, Alan Cumming, Scottish-American actor, singer, writer, filmmaker, and activist. Friday, 30th July, Stan Grant, we're a juryman, Australian television news and political journalist, and international affairs analyst. And Monday, 16th of August, Rhoda Roberts, a Bunjalung woman from northern New South Wales, producer, director, writer, broadcaster, performer, and arts executive, 
uh, and Wesley Enoch, Indigenous playwright and theatre director. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, stay around and have a chat afterwards if you can. Uh, and uh, safe driving home. Thank you. Thank you.